guest with us today, a man who has never done our show before. In fact, he's uh, almost done no television at all that I know of, particularly live television, yet he is considered by many uh, as one of the most influential figures in the rock star spectrum today. That's true. His albums are certified gold almost before they're shipped. Maybe even before they're cut. I would say, say yes. But his first musical efforts went unnoticed until he appeared on stage like this. There, but today we're going to get a glimpse of the real man behind those pictures. Please welcome the incredible David Bowie. Oh. Take up to me. There's always some change in the weather. It's time I know we could get it together. If you would stay here tonight, that would be crazy tonight. Stay. That's what I meant to say or do something. But what I never say is stay this time. I really meant to so bad. Cause you can never really tell When somebody wants something you want to Thanks for joining me in another episode of Why Not Go. I want to again thank everyone who subscribed to this channel and uh, the comments and uh, sort of the dialogue that uh, has uh, gone on with the comments. I, I really appreciate all of it and, and everyone that put likes and, and decided to subscribe. I, I'm very thankful. So first of all, great big, great big thank you. So, um, so this video is a little different. Um, it's about David Bowie. And uh, yes, I did, I did go all the way to Switzerland to, uh, to look for David Bowie. Um, I happened to be in Europe at the time, and uh, uh, so I didn't fly from LA to, to Switzerland. I flew from Spain to, to Switzerland and um, and uh, and it was uh, it was one of those decisions. I thought, kind of like the name of this channel. I thought, why not go? <laughs> why not go and search for for David, as I used to call him back then, as if I knew him. <laughs> so, uh, and I mentioned that in another video. Um, if you look on my rock playlist, you'll see that in. Um, June of last year, I was in New York City, and one of the first places I wanted to 
to go to was uh, besides CBGBs and and Max's Kansas City and places like that. I wanted to see where David Bowie lived uh, with his wife Iman. So I have a short video on that. It's not filmed very well. It's before I had a camera. It's just filmed on a on a on a phone and a cheap phone. But um, but it's a it's kind of a shoot short short video of me walking around. Uh, the building where, where he lived and where he passed away in 2016. Um, and I do mention in that video that I went all the way to Switzerland to, I guess you can call it stalking, to stalk David Bowie. So uh, so yeah, um, I'm kind of like a lot of uh, punk fans and musicians uh, back uh, in, the, in the 70s that were, you know, followers and, and fans of the Sex Pistols and a lot of the bands and even the band members themselves. I'll show a picture here of Sid Vicious. I love this picture. He's, uh, I think he's going to see the Ziggy Stardust tour, which I also saw when I was 15 in uh, LA at the Hollywood Palladium. Maybe I'll do a video on that because that's kind of a funny story. Um, but uh, this is Sid Vicious uh, uh, looking very young and cute with his Ziggy Stardust haircut and his showing off his t-shirt there. And I think this is 1973, and he's going to see uh, the Ziggy Stardust uh, tour, I think in, in Earl's Court. And uh, it was also interesting, I saw um, uh, an interview with Steve Jones on Fox News. This was years ago when his book came out, Lonely Boy, and the interviewer was asking him uh, if he was uh, affected by the death that year. I think of Prince and, and George Michael, and I think it was Bowie as well, and he said that Bowie um, the death of Bowie really, uh, really hurt him, really emotionally hurt him. And, uh, and I think he was like me, similar age. I think he's one or two years older. Um, we grew up on Bowie and uh, Roxy Music. And, uh, you know, it was a big part of our lives. God, I've, <laughs> the videos just started. I'm already getting emotional. Oh, dear. But, uh, it, but he said to the interviewer that uh, he didn't know Bowie. He only met him a couple times. Uh, but he uh, was very, very devastated, uh, or hurt, he said, that was his words. He said he was very hurt, very emotionally hurt um, by the death of, of David Bowie. And I was too, that was, that was, uh, that was a tough one. So uh, yeah, so it was the summer of uh, 1976. So let me uh, rewind a little bit. Uh, I love that clip there. So that was on the Dinah Shore show. It was a national show filmed in LA and uh, great song, song he did there, Stay, which is on the Station to Station album, of course. And uh, what's kind of ironic is that I, I flew to Spain to look for him in the small town of Veve um, in, in Switzerland. Uh, but I didn't know it at the time, but he had actually spent a lot of time in LA in 1975. Um, I learned that later, I got this book. It's actually the only Bowie book that I've ever read uh, it's called Bowie in Berlin, A New Career in a New Town. And uh, it's a great book. My husband Joe found it for me, I think at a discount store for like five bucks or something like that. And uh, I've actually never read a Bowie book before because I felt like I kind of grew up with Bowie. Um, and uh, not that I knew him personally, but I feel like I followed him through interviews over the years. So I never really read a book on him until this book. And this book was very illuminating. And uh, so I didn't know it at the time, but Bowie had actually spent quite a bit of time in LA in 1975. I'll show a picture here. Um, he recorded uh, a good part of the Station to Station album in late 1975, right on Fairfax Avenue. Look at him there, he looks so great. And it looks like he's carrying some tapes with him. Uh, he, uh, he uh, it's called Cherokee Studios on Fairfax and he recorded there, I think in the fall, like uh, September, October, November, something like that of 1975. And then even before that, he lived in LA and Doheny, right in uh, kind of the border of Beverly Hills and West Hollywood. And he lived there, I think with Angie part of the time. And um, and then he, uh, he also um, filmed The Man Who Fell to Earth in 1975. And I think most of that was filmed in New Mexico, but the ending scene there where he's uh, in the park uh, where he's supposed to be drunk and he's wearing the hat. Um, that was filmed right in, in LA. Uh, I remember when I saw that movie, I thought, oh my God, they filmed that right in MacArthur Park, downtown LA. 
So, so it was a different time back then. I guess it was a good time to be a star. You couldn't have crazy fans like me, kind of, kind of knowing where you were. And uh, so it is ironic that I went all the way to Switzerland when actually Bowie was was in my backyard um, for a lot of uh, 1975, either um, getting ready to, to film The Man Who Fell to Earth or recording uh, Station to Station. And uh, I love that clip there. So that was January 1976. He was on the, on the Dinah Shore show. And uh, so that time in music was very, uh, I think very exciting, very interesting. Um, in, uh, in November of 1975 was when the Sex Pistols first played at St. Martin's uh, College of Art. And also in November of 1975, uh, that was when the Patti Smith Horses album came out, and I love that album, and I still love that album. I, I like a lot of her work. Um, so things were changing, and Bowie, you know, Bowie didn't have to try to be punk, of course. Bowie was Bowie, um, but he uh, uh, he definitely, that Station Station album, I remember when that came out. I think that came out in January of 1976, and I remember I heard it on the radio for the first time before it was even available in the in the stores and I just couldn't believe that first track it was so heavy and it sounded like a train and I loved the lyrics the return of the the thin white duke throwing darts in lovers eyes I mean that was just that was just something uh, it's still a great 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 album um, and uh, so that was a busy busy time for him and as I said music was changing the other thing that happened during that time I think it was um, I think it was April of 1976, right around that time, uh, the Ramones album first came out. So, uh, so you have Bowie doing his thing with Station to Station, and then you have Patti Smith and the Sex Pistols and, uh, and uh, the Ramones. Um, so music was, uh, music was really, really changing during that time. So I saw the Station to Station tour. He played three nights at... Um, at the Forum in, in downtown LA. And I went all three nights. I just, you know, I was, uh, I was, I was far gone when it comes to being a Bowie fan. I went all three nights. And I remember one of the nights, uh, you could see Angie on the side of the stage with cute little Zoe, he had long, their son, he had long blonde hair and he was kind of dancing around on the side of the stage. And, and I didn't even have good tickets. I was way up high somewhere, but I could see them on the side of the stage. and. I thought, oh, that's exciting. There's Angie. There's, there's, uh, there's Zoe. So, um, so he toured um, that Station to Station album. He toured um, all through uh, uh, February until um, until I think uh, May, May 18th, and the last date on the tour was uh, in Paris, May 18th. And during that time. Uh, Angie had secured a house in Veve, Switzerland, and um, I'll just put the map up here so you can kind of see where that is. It's on Lake Geneva. They call it the Swiss Riviera, and uh, and they uh, so I don't. I think it was a house they rented. Um, I'll put a picture here. Uh, she said it looked like a cuckoo clock, and, and she said David never really liked it. He thought it was too twee, <laughs> which I think means too like cutesy. Um, but so during that time uh, where he was on tour, when he was on tour in 76, she uh, secured the move and she had a history of uh, uh, being in, in Switzerland. She actually went to school there when she was, when she was little and so uh, when she was younger. And then Bowie uh, during that time really rekindled his relationship with, with Iggy Pop. He, he had known Iggy um, since, I think, 1972, and I know he had worked on one of the Stooges albums, uh, but it was during that time that they really kind of rekindled their, their friendship and what would become their working relationship. And uh, uh, Iggy traveled a lot with him on that Station Station tour, and they went to um, at Russia at one point. I love the pictures of them. And, in, in Russia and uh, they were very, they seemed like they were very, very close, very good friends. I don't know if Iggy was with them the whole tour, but I know that he was with them on and off during, during that tour. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was kind of the beginning of an important relationship between Iggy and, and Bowie because when he finished the tour in Paris in, in May, 
um, Bowie secured some uh, studio time at the Chateau de Oroville, and that's where Bowie uh, recorded pinups, and he secured studio time to work on Iggy's album, The Idiot. So during their time, and yeah, if you ever want to read a Bowie book, and, and you already know a lot about Bowie, like I thought I did, this one's really interesting, because it talks about that pivotal time, and also their relationship, and I think, during their time together, 1976 to 79, you know, they lived together in Berlin uh, in, in an apartment, and Bowie produced Low and um, Heroes and Lodger, those three albums, great albums, and Iggy produced, um, uh, what were the albums, got The Idiot and Lust for Life. And so it was, uh, it was a great working relationship, and, uh, and I always loved those those albums, the three albums that Bowie did during that time, and then Iggy's uh, The Idiot and, and Lust for Life. So um, before I get into my summer of 1976, when I went to Veve, I'll, uh, I'll put up a, a video here. It's just a short video. It's also on the Dinah Shore show. Uh, I always thought Dinah Shore kind of had a crush on Iggy Pop, <laughs> if you watch the way she looks at him. And this is about a year later, it's in April, when Bowie and Iggy toured together, but Iggy was the headliner and Bowie was just the keyboard player. I don't know if that tour went to England, it probably did, uh, but I thought it was great because I remember when Iggy was on stage at first, when Bowie was on stage at first, I was like looking at him like, oh my God, I can't believe that's Bowie and he's there and he's playing the keyboards. Uh, and they played a fairly you know, small auditorium. I think it was the Santa Monica Civic in LA, uh, but, uh, but Iggy being Iggy, uh, he was, he's such a great performer. I think by about the, fir the first song, I kind of forgot that Bowie was there and I was just mesmerized by Iggy, whom I loved. I've always loved Iggy. I, I saw him, I think in, um, I think it was 1973 at the Whiskey. He kind of scared me at that time, but, uh, but, uh, but I loved, uh, I've always loved Iggy. So, um, so yeah, so before I get into that summer, uh, in Spain and uh, going to Veve. Let me just play a short interview here on the same show, the Dinah Shore show in April of 77 and Bowie and Iggy talking about their uh, their relationship together. And Iggy Pop and David Bowie. You must be exhausted. A little bit uh, keyed up now. I know. That's kind of hard to come down from. It's difficult to, to break back out of. Of course. I'm going to call you Jimmy, if sure. I may. Sure, I appreciate it. Jimmy, when you do two and three shows a night, mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, well, how, do you, how do you come out? Usually, when we work, I do that mm -hmm. for about an hour and a half. <laughs> Good heavens. You've known each other for years, haven't you? Yeah, for mm. six years. Where did you meet? What inspired this? <laughs> <laughs> Where did you meet? In a bar. In a bar. In New York. Yeah. <laughs> You sure? <laughs> we were both unrecognized at the time, so we had a lot to, you know, in common. But, right. but you knew that you, but you were both interested in music. Yeah. No, not music. No, you, whatever you call it, you call it music. Yeah. What do you call this? Well, punk. What is this? This isn't music. This is nothing. You don't do punk rock. <laughs> what is? It? Explain to me what it is. Um, David. <laughs> David. Well, it's not. Uh, my understanding of punk rock is. Uh, something that's happened in England, I think, really, over the last couple of years. But uh, what Jimmy was doing, uh, I'd never seen Jimmy, really, but I'd heard some of his albums. And uh, it sounded like, uh, uh, I don't know, nihilistic rock. It was nihilism, but, but let's which do. fascinates me. What, what, what I love I... nihilism. <laughs> well, well, I just love philosopher talk. <laughs> No, but that, that, that's interesting because uh, it's a little remote from reality at times. No, it doesn't. Oh, no, not at all. No. 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 no? No. But now in your collaboration, what do you consider your, uh, what type of music do you do then, David? Myself? Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, I went and asked Jimmy. <laughs> and what kind of room? You had heard. Not of his is, his is a bit up there. Yes, it is. It's a bit more airy. Yeah. My 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 music is just basically I look for things to tear apart, you know. And, mm. Oh, that's good to whip. You know, that's very you easy. You don't even think about it before you do it. It just happens, doesn't it? When you well, not what does. Jimmy did when we were in a. Do you mind me talking? No, no. Um, you sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the studio, that Jimmy would um, make up the lyrics on the spot, and we would keep everything that he did, and uh, occasionally change a line after we recorded. But to Jimmy, I'd, I've never seen anybody be able to make up lyrics so fast, just out of his head to a track. And it's more like a, uh, I guess uh, he'll hate me, but it's it's more like a. Uh, the beatnik era mm -hmm. thing with you see <laughs> well, hurt, though. but you cut yourself with a bottle yeah well that was because i'd i'd done something really foolish the night before and i was ashamed <laughs> I, had left, I had left a i had left this 13 year old girl at an, at a strand at an airport uh, on the east coast and she was from the west coast I and I thought that wasn't right to do to her. No, that's not right. So right, so I got up on stage and I, I thought, well, what is a fool, what is a, a horrible person like you doing up on this stage? This is all wrong. And I felt so bad that I thought, ah, the heck with it. I grabbed a glass. Oh, Jim. But that was, well, I've, I've since, I've had treatment for that sort of thing. In my sense. <laughs> yeah, it helped a lot. You know? Jimmy, that's a It's better to be able to laugh about it now. Yeah, that's really a hard See, way to do it. See, I knew, I'll tell you. Rosie was saying, we were saying, you know, you burn yourself with the hot rollers when you're on the road. <laughs> yeah. Burn your hair with it. It's about the extent of it. But, but to do what you did to it's always, yourself. no, listen, it's, it sounds funny, but, um, yeah, it is funny. It's really funny. <laughs> But no, I was going to say something very heavy and, and no, meaningful, but I can't. No, I know you, <laughs> you, <don't, yeah. laughs> you You saw Iggy perform. What was your I reaction? never saw Iggy perform. I, well, just, heard, I just heard, heard the oh, albums. Yeah. And uh, then, I must admit, somebody played me a, a videotape of uh, a, a performance that he did with um, uh, the, uh, his original band, The Stooges. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't like it very much because I, uh, because then I saw the violence. And it's not what I heard from the lyrics. Because oh. you, your music, when, when you, I mean, you have a lovely, as you say, sound way up I'm a cyborg. My, my cyborg? stuff is, is very different. Mine comes from sort of up to from right. there. Yeah. And Jimmy's comes from about here down to, boom. <laughs> <laughs> about there. You know. I don't know. I wonder what he means by that. <laughs> I don't know. I'll ask you later. Right? Okay, kid. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you. No, no. <laughs> no, what I what I wanted to know, what was the audience's reaction when you did those things well, to, to them or, or to yourself? It would depend. I did a lot of very good shows then, too. It's like anybody that's reaching sort of like that. Sometimes you'll do incredibly good things and not know it. So sometimes the audience would literally just go nuts, and they'd usually get very demonstrative. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would all pass out. They did? Yeah, they took a lot of... But not much response when they do that. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they would, sometimes they would just, uh, if it was a room this size, uh, they would all press themselves in groups against the wall as far away as they could get from me and just, they'd watch in horror, but they wouldn't be able to leave either. Yeah. They would have, they would be sort of fascinated. With you can it. talk about it now, and you've had treatment. I can talk about it if yeah. it's required. It's not my uh, preferred I subject. Oh, I don't want to make you uncomfortable. I just, but do you feel that in your music you had a chance, coupled mm -hmm. with the violence, to contribute something? I think I've contributed something else. I think, yeah. Yeah. In what you, in the statement in your music, or in what you were saying about yourself and in the violence I, you per perpetrated on I yourself. don't know about that, I, but it must have been something good that I've done. Oh, I'm sure of that. I, don't I mean... think perhaps just that there are a lot of people who have enjoyed what I've done mm -hmm. for a long time, so that's good enough, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Do you feel you've influenced anybody in the... I think I helped wipe out the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so back in my tiki room. I actually have a tiki drink with me now. It's called a, a painkiller. It's a, a simple drink to make, and... I guess it cures your pain, whether it's emotional or, or physical. So I love that clip that I just played. Um, that was Bowie and Iggy again on the Dinosaur Show in April of 1977. And uh, the woman on the right there is, is Rosemary Clooney, by the way. And she used to be, um, or she was uh, 
George Clooney, the actor George Clooney, that's his aunt. And she was a famous singer in, I think in the 50s, 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, but I love that video. It just, it looks like uh, Bowie and Iggy are having such a good time creatively and friendship wise. And uh, I love it when, uh, when Dinah Shore says to him, do you think you've influenced anybody, Jimmy? <laughs> just, that's just, it's so hysterical because it's like, has he influenced anybody? It's like, who hasn't he influenced would be, would be a better question. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, I, I just love that interview. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I love it when Bowie says that line about my music is from here to here and Jimmy's is from, is down there. That's so great. It's so great. If you, if you go on YouTube, you can see, uh, the full interview and, and the show. And, uh, and I'm so happy that Iggy's still around. Unfortunately, Bowie and Lou Reed aren't around anymore, but um, Iggy is, uh, I'm so happy that he's, he's healthy, lives in Miami, and I bought his latest uh, record. I think it was called uh, Every Loser. I really, really like that record. And, uh, and he still performs, obviously. I think he mainly does uh, big festivals these days, but I'm just so glad that, that he's still around. So. so in the spring of 1976, I had just started college. I got out of um, high school, uh, um, uh, a little bit early and uh, and and uh, and I started college and that's where I met my friend Sue uh, because I had uh, we met because of Bowie I had a license plate that said Bowie one on my Dodge Colt and uh, I couldn't get Bowie I had to get Bowie with the number one <clears throat> and she left a note on my windshield one day and said oh you're a Bowie fan I am too and and she had something to say about some recent appearance on TV I think and and uh, we became friends uh, over David Bowie, and then obviously we became big Sex Pistol fans uh, in uh, in uh, later on. At the time, I didn't know. Um, I knew about the Ramones and and Patti Smith, of course. But in the summer of uh, 1976, I didn't know about the punk scene in in England. In retrospect, uh, I probably should have gone to to England as well, uh, to London and check out the punk scene. But I, um, I, uh, I knew, um, I might've known a little bit, but I didn't really start reading about the punk scene in, in London until uh, probably uh, maybe September, October, November of 1976. So uh, yeah, so I, I love David Bowie. Um, had loved him since 1973. The, um, the film, The Man Who Fell to Earth, came out, I think, in May of 1976. And Sue and I used to go there almost every day. My schoolwork was probably already suffering. We would go, uh, I think we saw that film maybe 50 times, literally. I could probably re recite the dialogue back then in the film. Uh, but it was such a different time because you didn't have the, uh, you didn't have the internet, obviously, or uh, movies on tape, so we would... We just couldn't believe that we could go to a movie theater and just see David up on the screen and hear his voice speaking. And it was just so excited. We would just go there. And sometimes I'd go by myself and I would just go there and just just stare at him. <laughs> so, so yeah, as I said earlier, I was pretty far gone as far as being a, a Bowie fan. So in the summer um, uh, of 1976, um, I went to Spain from, I think it was from middle of July, middle of June till about the middle of August. I remember it was about two months. Might have been a little more, a little less, but that's the, pretty much the time frame. And uh, I always wanted to be better with my Spanish. You know, when you live in LA, Spanish is important. You hear it all around. And I knew a little bit, but I thought, this is gonna be great if I can really kind of immerse myself. And uh, my parents, as I probably alluded to, they weren't the best parents in the world, but. But they weren't the worst either, and, and as far as if I wanted to spend money on education, they were usually all for it. So I couldn't believe it that I could actually go to Spain. I went to Malaga uh, and earned college credits, and I think I got quite a few college credits for that summer course. And then you're supposed to you know, immerse yourself in the language and hopefully get, get proficient um, afterwards. So, uh, so I, I left in uh, the middle of June. I arrived in Malaga. And I was so excited because I thought, oh, I'm going to stay in a, with a Hispanic family. 
And usually uh, Hispanic families, from my experience in LA, they're usually very warm and, and um, friendly. But uh, <laughs> I think that was the first lesson I learned that summer. I thought, well, don't, don't expect things to be great. You know, don't expect things to be bad, but don't necessarily expect things to be great. Um, because I was very disappointed. They weren't warm at all. It was like, uh, it was like going to a foster home, uh, even though it was just a short time, but you're thinking that, oh, they really want to be around, you know, kids. And, and this family didn't. You could tell they just did it for the money. They weren't interested in talking to me. And, and the food they gave us at lunch was terrible. It was usually like they were eating something really nice like paella and we we got like rice and a hot dog or something. Um, but uh, I had another girl with me. The, the program was through the University of San Diego. The exchange, uh, what do you call it, the, the program to learn Spanish over there. And we went to class Monday through Friday. And, uh, and the girl that I was with, um, I don't remember her name, so I'll call her Surfer Girl. She was blonde and she really did surf, which I found kind of fascinating because I, I grew up in Southern California and I went to the beach sometimes, but my skin was always the kind of skin that would just burn. But this girl was like, she really surfed and she was, you know, she was telling me about that. She used to, I remember her saying she used to surf around the San Onofre nuclear power plant uh, because the water was warm there. So hopefully she's, she's okay. I remember at the time thinking, really? Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the family wasn't warm, but at least I had the, the surfer girl there. We shared a room in their apartment. They had an apartment over a, over a store, which is very different for me coming from Southern California where most people had a house and, and lived in the suburbs. And uh, they lived near the center of town and their apartment was over a store. And, uh, but I, I will say, and then I'll get to my, my trip to uh, Ve Ve, uh, the, Spain at the time was a, kind of interesting place. It definitely had some good and bad and I would say the bad was that the men were just awful. Um, the surfer girl and I, and I'll show a picture of her here, she's on the left. She, uh, she her hair was very blonde as you can see and uh, she couldn't walk down the street without guys like uh, yelling at her, Rubia, Rubia, which I think means blonde or, or you know, they'd say, where are you going? You know, hello, hello. and you know, Don De Vos, where are you going? And and they, if we walked around together, I'll show a picture of me here. Um, I was already putting henna on my hair, so my hair used to be more blonde. It's a little more red here, and I'm wearing a diamond dog shirt. So that's that's the way I looked in the summer of 1976. So Malaga was a strange place. It was, it's like they weren't used to seeing blonde girls, I guess. Um, I remember saying to the surfer girl at one point, like, I remember saying, God, I, I think I kind of know what the Beatles went through. <laughs> because, I mean, literally, we could not, especially when we were together, we could not walk down the street without at least two or three guys crowding around us. So it was kind of like harassment. Um, you know, I didn't, we didn't really like it. She started wearing a hat to cover up her, her blonde hair. Um, and it was also kind of a, a strange place. Like, they weren't used to seeing people from other places. We had an African-American guy in our group in our studies and he was very tall, I remember, maybe like 6'4 or something. And when we walked down the street with him, people would be pointing and laughing at him. It was like, I don't know if they never saw a black man before or never saw a tall man before, um, but it was, a, it was kind of a strange, strange place, you know. So. Um, uh, but it had its good. I'll, I'll show a picture here. Um, I loved it when people would walk around at night because um, everybody had the big afternoon meal and people would walk around at night uh, and, you know, have a coffee or wine or something. They had like a big promenade. I love that. Um, but it was a kind of a funny, it was a kind of funny experience. Um, and then the family, as I said, they were kind of cold. They didn't want to talk to surfer girl or me. <laughs> And uh, they, they didn't always feed us the same things that they were eating. And we would just laugh about it later. Um, and then they had a son who was kind of creepy, he kept staring at us. And, and uh, he actually told us, uh, this was a while later, that he would take us to a flamenco show to see Spanish dancing. And he actually took us to a stripper show. So it was, it was an odd place. The, the young men were very... Uh, I don't know if they were pent up or what, but it was uh, it was an uh, odd experience to be uh, a young a young girl walking around with these men yelling at you. But nothing bad happened, so that was okay. 
So I was there for about, I think about a month, and it was really kind of getting to me that, that I knew David Bowie lived in Veve. I had read that, and I knew that, um, you know, Europe is smaller than the U.S. And I thought, well, you know, I'd been there about a month, and my parents had given me traveler's checks. Back then you had traveler's checks, and I wasn't spending much money. If I went out to eat, I usually went to the Woolworths, like, lunch counter or something. They had a Woolworths there. And, uh, and so I thought, you know, because my parents would never approve, I thought, well, you know, I could probably uh, book a flight to Veve, to Geneva. You have to go to Geneva and then spend a couple nights in Veve. And I don't think they would ever know because I've got quite a bit of traveler's checks left, so they won't know how I spend them. So uh, it was right around July when I'd been there about a month and that I booked it. I thought, you know what? Just uh, why not go, as I said earlier, and, uh, and I booked the flight. And I remember I we didn't have class that Friday, so I thought, oh, this is perfect. I booked a flight to um, Geneva on Friday, and then uh, I booked a flight back on, on Sunday night. So I was going to spend two nights in Veve. And uh, yeah, and I was just crazy about David Bowie. Like I said, I didn't know he had spent time in, in L.A. in 1975, but it was like... Um, as I said, I used to call him David back then, Sue and I did, as if we knew him. And I just remember thinking, oh God, I love David so much, but I'm in LA and he's always on the other side of the world in London or Europe. And now I'm in Europe and he's not that far. So so, um, so anyway, so I booked the flight um, to uh, from Malaga to uh, Geneva and uh, took the train to Veve. And, um, so yeah, I was excited, you know, because as I said, he, growing up in LA, and I just always thought, oh God, I love David Bowie so much, but he's always on the other side of the world. And now, <clears throat> for the first time, I thought, oh, he has a house, um, and he's in this town called Veve, um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there. I'm, I'm on a mission. I'm gonna go there and look for him. And Bowie, I'll show a picture of him with this t-shirt on, uh, I love Switzerland t-shirt. But we actually had a long uh, history of being in Switzerland. Um, after they had that house in uh, in Veve, it was actually in an area called Blanay. I didn't know that, but that was just outside of Veve, like up on the hill. Um, <clears throat> he uh, he kept the house, I think, until about 1982. He divorced Angie Bowie in in 1980, and then he kept the house. I think he lived there. I think he got custody of Zoe. He lived there with Zoe until. Um, about 1982 and then he bought a place and I'll show a picture here it's like a huge chateau again in the same area I think this was just in Lucerne and Lucerne and Veve and Montreux they're all in that same area that they call the Swiss Riviera there on Lake Geneva and uh, and so he has a, a long a long he had a long history there he had he bought another house in 1982 a big house after he wasn't with uh, Angie anymore and, um, and then when he met Iman in 1990, um, and then married her in 1992, they actually got married at the registrar office, I think in Lucerne, and then I'll show their wedding pictures here. They have such nice wedding pictures uh, in uh, Italy when they got married in 1992. Um, he, uh, in the picture here with Zoe, who now would call himself Duncan, Duncan Jones, such a handsome young man. Um, so he actually married Iman in that area, the Veve Lucerne area, and then um, and then they lived there in that big house for a while. But for Iman, being from you know a model in New York, I guess it was kind of isolating. And then they ended up moving to New York in 1995. And then he finally sold the house, I think, in 2000. So um, so yeah, so he did have a long history of being in that Veve area. Um, either renting a house with Angie or owning a house and, and living in it later with with Iman and, and his son Duncan. So um, so yeah, so in the middle of July I booked a flight. I remember um, I didn't have to, there was no school on a Friday and so I booked a flight on Friday, that Friday morning uh, and then uh, coming back uh, Sunday night. Uh, so I thought I have two two nights, two nights to find David, <laughs> two days and two nights to find David. So uh, so I got to uh, Geneva. I think it was a pretty short flight, maybe a couple hours. And I got to Geneva, and then I took a train and 
and um, right upon my arrival I was like boots on the ground I'm gonna look for I'm gonna look for David <laughs> and um, I remember asking the hope excuse me the hotel clerk have you seen David Bowie like is he does he come here <laughs> and and uh, and then I remember going out and I asked a news agent does David Bowie come here or do you see do you see David Bowie and and uh, I went to a co coffee places and stores and I remember even going to a pharmacy and looking uh, and asking do you see David Bowie here <laughs> does he come in um, because I figured like he's got to be like a place where he goes to you know have a regular coffee or or have a um, uh, you know go to a pharmacy to get buy cough syrup or something um, but it was I was it was a very frustrating first day that that Friday so um, I couldn't find anybody that uh, had a lot of them didn't seem like they even heard of David Bowie. They didn't know who he was. Maybe they didn't understand my accent. I don't know. I don't speak French. That was another problem. And I don't think many people spoke English. So there was a big language barrier. Um, so, but anyway, I went to bed that night in the hotel, and I thought, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna, tomorrow I'm gonna hit the ground running. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out there and find him. There's got to be some lead somewhere where I'm gonna meet somebody that says, oh yeah, he comes. He comes by here every day at, you know, three o'clock. <laughs> then I can be there at three o'clock. So, um, and the irony is I'm, I was a very shy person. I mean, I still am shy, but, but, uh, but anyway, I was determined to, to find him. And so the next day I did the same thing. I'm, I'm going around, I'm, I'm looking at such a beautiful place. Uh, I'll show a couple of pictures here. I mean, the streets were, some of the streets were cobblestone and, and it's such a dramatic place because you get the, the mountains and the lake and it's just like and and uh and i'm from i'm from downey so it's down i mean there's some pretty places in la but in my opinion downey isn't one of them it's very flat and it's like endless car lots and and strip malls and it does have the oldest mcdonald's which is kind of cool but but uh it's not like pasadena or glendale and Down, downey's not not the prettiest place in the world, in my opinion, and, and I'm here in in Vey Vey, and I thought, oh my God, David has, David has really good taste. So, so that Saturday, I, I did the same thing. I'm just like walking, walking, asking people, um, and I, you know, and, and after a while, I just got kind of tired, and and I had a light lunch, and then I went around some more. I, I started going to kind of high-end stores asking people if they've seen David Bowie. <laughs> I figure he's got he's to gotta shop somewhere um, or go somewhere. And, um, but it was, very, it was very frustrating. And, and uh, to be honest, I wasn't really enjoying myself in this, in this beautiful place. And so um, it was kind of late in the afternoon. I think it was about like four or four-ish or something. And um, I walk over to the, the lake and, um, and I'll show a picture here. You can, this is a picture that I took and uh, you can see the benches there. And I, remember, um, and I remember sitting on that bench like it was yesterday. And I remember sitting there thinking, here I am in, in his hometown, but um, it's the strangest feeling, but I've never felt so far from him. I just felt like, I felt like, uh, and maybe it's because there was not even record stores there with like his his records I could look at. It was a very high end kind of place, um, and uh, and I just felt so so like I don't know so so frustrated, and I felt like a loser, like I'd wasted all this money to come here, and and uh, I'm not going to find him, and and uh, I was very down on myself, and I thought. Um, uh, you know, this is a really, what a dumb thing I did. Um, and uh, wasting my parents' money on this trip. And then, and then, uh, as I said, I remember sitting on one of those benches looking out at the beautiful lake. And, and, uh, and I just thought, I, I don't know why. I said, but I just feel so far from him. I, I've never felt so far from David Bowie as when I was in Vey Vey. And again, I hope I don't get emotional, but, and, uh, and then it dawned on me. It really, it was like an epiphany. It just, it, it was like the second big lesson I learned that that summer. And and that was the lesson was that um, my David Bowie wasn't there at all. He was um, he was back in my room in Downey. He was waiting for me there. That was that was my David Bowie. 
um, because you know the David Bowie I knew was was his music, his you know all the records I had in my bedroom and and the posters on the wall. Um, that was the David Bowie I knew and loved, and and you know would stay up at night and listen to records. Um, uh, you know till in the middle of the night with my headphones on so I wouldn't disturb my parents. Um, and uh, you know that was my David Bowie. He was he was waiting for me back in my bedroom. He was he was in all those records. And, uh, and I felt so much better after that. I thought, no wonder, no wonder why he's not, I don't feel close to him because my David Bowie is, is back there in Downey. And I thought to myself, there is a David Bowie here. And, uh, you know, that's the private David Bowie. He's, he's probably, uh, you know, uh, you know, walking the streets every once in a while with his son or, or with, uh, with Angela. Um, but uh, that's the private David Bowie, and I'm sure he's a very charming man, I thought, but, but that's not the David Bowie that I know. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm not supposed to know that David Bowie. That's the private David Bowie. Um, my David was, was in his records. And I just felt like, at that moment, I just felt like it was like a huge weight lifted off me. And I thought, I'm gonna thank David Bowie for this moment because it brought me to this beautiful place. Even if I never find him or meet him, it, in searching for him, I, I, uh, I, I came to that came to that sort of epiphany, and I also came to uh, this beautiful place. So I felt so much better. I think I had a good little cry there by the by the river, <laughs> kind of like I sort of having a cry now, and I and I just thought I feel so much better. I feel so much better. And so, um, so after that, I, I walked around the town and it's so beautiful. And I took some pictures and I'll show them here. I took pictures of the streets and uh, I took a picture of the train station. On some of them, you can see it's kind of getting that, that bluish light because it's getting a little, a little dark. Um, and uh, and I, I remember walking around just feeling like really good. I don't have to look for for uh, David Bowie, um, I, I know where he is. Um, and then I, uh, yeah, and then I just took some pictures and and uh, and I'll show some of them here. They're not great pictures, but these are just my pictures from the trip. And uh, one of the last photos that I took is uh, of the lake again, when it was getting dark and uh, and also of the boats. So they had, you know, it's so beautiful. People have their little, little boats there on the lake. And uh, so I kind of got up and, and just felt like a different person after that. And as I said, I took some, took some photos and then I went, uh, and I went and had a really relaxing meal, which I hadn't done before. I kind of treated myself. Uh, I think I went to a little Italian cafe because um, I didn't really know French food. And there was also German food in the town. I didn't really know German food, but I knew, I knew uh, Italian food. I think I had a spaghetti dinner. And I didn't ask anyone if they saw David Bowie. <laughs> I didn't ask anyone. Um, I, uh, I didn't ask anyone and I had a really, really nice meal. And uh, I remember going back to my, uh, to the hotel after that. I, I had a big Toblerone bar with me. I love Toblerone chocolate, it's a Swiss chocolate. And uh, I remember going back to the, the room and I think watched uh, some silly American TV shows that were dubbed in French and, uh, and uh, had a nice sleep. So, um, so that was my, that was the extent of my weekend. I, I woke up the next day and I felt really good. Uh, tried to walk around some more and just enjoy the, the beautiful place that I was in. I, since I've never been back to Switzerland, I don't know why, but, um, but I've never been back there, but I can thank David Bowie for, uh, for, uh, for taking me there. So, um, and then I since, after that, I had since learned from this book, because I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know where David was uh, when I was there. Um, after he finished the, uh, the Station to Station tour in uh, May, he booked tour, uh, uh, studio time in the Chateau de Oroville uh, for Iggy's album, The Idiot. And it says in this book that he actually spent the most time that he's ever spent in Veve. Um, uh, uh, from I believe it was about May uh, 
20th to the end of June. So, um, uh, so during that time, uh, so I was there in July. So when I was there, um, he was uh, recording the Idiot album uh, and, and writing the music with, uh, with Iggy in, in uh, France. So he could have come to Veve, say, on a, on a weekend to see his son or to see Angie. I don't know. But, uh, but he actually was not there uh, during that time. He was making great music uh, with Iggy. They were doing the, uh, the Idiot album in, uh, in July of 1976. And then after that, they went, I think, to Munich to finish the album. And then after that kind of began their, their time in Germany and, and living in, in Berlin. So when I was walking around frantically looking for David in, uh, in Veve, um, he was actually in the studio with, with Iggy just outside of Paris doing the great, the great uh, album, uh, The Idiot. So, um, so we'll end this video, um, uh, uh, and please, um, I, I hope you enjoyed it, and I encourage anyone to make comments about maybe what crazy things you did uh, uh, looking for, for your David Bowie or, or someone else, um, whoever that might be. <laughs> so, um, so thanks for, for watching. I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed my latest trip down memory, memory lane. As I said, I, I would love to hear other people's comments about maybe any other rock stars they've followed or, or did, did kind of crazy things to, to try to meet. Uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so I guess that ends it. I'm gonna show the, and uh, uh, again, thanks for watching and subscribing. And until the next time, I'll be, I'll be seeing ya.